One of the things to recall as we're going through the book of Mark is that everything in Mark is definitely historically accurate. All of these things actually did occur as they did. But remember that Mark is not writing a complete biography of Jesus. And he's not also writing a strict historical account in the, in the sense that not everything is necessarily chronological. Mark is putting the material together oftentimes to make theological points. And we've been seeing that in the last couple of sermons after Christmas. So if you remember, we saw two accounts that were correlated together. Mark put them together. We don't know how much time transpired between them, but again, they make a theological point. The two accounts that we saw, that we studied, were the account when Jesus stilled the storm with the disciples in the boat. And then the next account that Mark recorded that we looked at last week was Jesus calmed a storm inside of a man. We came across the grassing, grassing demoniac who had been tormented by a legion of demons. And Jesus was able to cast those demons out and the man became a disciple of Jesus. He became back, uh, a human being again under the control of his own faculties. He was in his right mind, clothed, and wanted to follow Jesus. Now, in both of those accounts, what we saw was the power of God being manifested through Jesus. We saw two very miraculous things take place. And one thing we have to remember is that even though the power of God was demonstrated through the person of Jesus, even though these wonderful miracles took place, they did not produce faith in the majority of people. Instead, they actually brought fear. So if you remember from the account of Jesus calming the storm, the disciples were more afraid of Jesus and the power that he wielded than the storm that just about killed them. Then with the demoniac, Jesus cast out a legion of demons effortlessly because he is God and he has that authority. And instead of the townspeople being just filled with awe and, and, and faith, they were more afraid of Jesus than they were the demoniac. And that's a striking thing. I mean, I don't know if any of you watch horror movies or those movies that deal with the demon demonic. I don't like that. But have you seen any of the ghost hunter things and that? And those, those shows, they'll come across what they call ghosts. And then other times the people freak out because they're like, this isn't a ghost, this is demonic. And, and they panic. But, you know, just imagine if you went into something that was supposedly a haunted house and you stayed there all by yourself at night with no lights or anything, who would do that, okay? But here we have a real life account where this isn't just drama on TV. This demoniac, demoniac was out of his mind. He had superhuman strength. He was able to break chains and shackles. He was screaming, cutting himself. People were terrified of him. And the ironic thing in this, this frightful situation, that's one of the scariest things you would ever encounter, the people, again, are more afraid of Jesus and the power of God he willed in than they are of this demoniac. And again, in both cases, most of the people had no faith. The, the disciples did not have faith. Jesus questioned them. It's like, after everything you've seen, guys, you still don't have faith? And then with the demoniac, the only one we're told had faith was the demoniac himself. He's, he's seated at Jesus' feet and wants to follow him. So we see how even the power of God does not bring about faith. Now, in the accounts that we're going to see today, two more miracles of Jesus, we're not told that people were afraid when Jesus did what he did, but what we see are examples of faith. So it's kind of interesting and obviously not haphazard that Mark puts those two accounts about Jesus calming the storm and Jesus casting out the demons, casting, calming the storm inside the man, that he shows those two accounts where God's power did not produce faith. And then in the next two accounts that he provides, he shows us what real faith looks like. So what we're going to see today is a couple of accounts of faith. All right. Now, the title of my message, is it on there? Yeah. 
Jesus heals the hopeless as that in these two accounts, one is Jesus healing the daughter of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and the other one is the woman that had a menstrual flow for many years. In both of those cases, the people are entirely hopeless, and we'll see that. Yet Jesus comes in, and because of their faith, he delivers them from absolutely hopeless situations. I mean, the woman we'll see had a hopeless situation, but certainly Jairus' daughter had no hope because she was dead by the time Jesus got there. But we see what faith looks like, and we see what faith can do. So very remarkable accounts that Mark gives us here. All right, so let's stand up in honor of God's word, and let's read the passage of scripture that we're going to go through. It's kind of a long passage. All right, so read out loud with me. Mark records, when Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and seeing him fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. A woman who had a hemorrhage, had a, a woman who had, had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up, and she fell in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official, saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any more? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official, and he saw a commotion, and people loudly weeping and wailing. And entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him, but putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions, and entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astounded. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And he said that something should be given to her to eat. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you that we could come this morning and meet here. We thank you that we can study your word and also worship you in song. Father, thank you for the examples of faith that we see in these passages. And thank you that we can see what faith in Jesus can bring about. It can bring about the turning of events so that a hopeless situation becomes hopeful someone who has had an illness for a very long time can be healed and someone who has died could be raised from the dead. Father, we don't often see those kinds of miracles in our day and it's not necessarily because, as some would say, we don't have enough faith, but we do have examples of faith here that I pray that we could apply to our lives and that we could see that no matter how dire our sins are, no matter how 
corrupt we may be, no matter how unclean and unworthy we may be, we can come to you in faith and be healed and have life and be forgiven. And I pray that we would always remember that and always come to Jesus for our forgiveness. And we ask that you would now open the eyes of our hearts to understand these truths. I pray, Father, that this message would be yours and not mine and that the Holy Spirit would speak through me. I pray again, the Holy Spirit would just enlighten the eyes of our hearts. And I pray that we would all leave here changed. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I don't know if you caught from reading this, and if you remember from when we started way back when with the introduction, we said that the book of Mark for many centuries was just kind of relegated to the dustbin because it was thought early in the church's history that Mark wrote his material from other writers, the synoptic writers, and that his was just a, a truncated form of like Matthew. And so Mark wasn't really paid attention to until a few hundred years ago when scholars started to believe that Mark actually was the first one to write his gospel, and Matthew and Luke actually use a lot of material from that. Now, either way, the important thing to realize is that as scholars started to look at the book of Mark again, they recognized that this was not some crude book because Mark's language is often a little bit crude, it's not as polished as the other writers, but it was actually a masterfully written account. Of course it was, it was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we see that Mark oftentimes uses very sophisticated literary devices. One of those is a sandwich technique where he'll take kind of the meat of the sandwich and put two other parts of a story or two different stories on either side. Here we have one of those sandwiches. What's the bread on one side? Well, we have Jairus, the synagogue leader, coming to Jesus, asking him to heal his daughter, okay? And we see Jesus, from reading what we just read, leaves and starts to go with Jairus, and as he's walking through the crowd, what happens? Another account takes place. A woman with a hemorrhage comes up behind him, touches his robe, and is healed. That's the meat in the sandwich. And then after Jesus has his encounter with the women, woman, then we have the other piece of bread on the other side. That is, Jesus goes to Jairus' house and heals his little daughter. So with that, we have these two accounts that, if they weren't connected by a theological point, would really have very little in common other than Jesus performed a healing. Because on one hand, you have a woman that has a hemorrhage, it was a menstrual flow, so she had menstrual bleeding that didn't stop, we're told, for 12 whole years, okay? And she's, we'll get into details, but it's been horrendous for her. She's hopeless. And then we have, on the other hand, a little girl who Jesus raises from the dead. So the accounts are different, but what ties them all together, the main thing is both of these are accounts of people's faith, okay? Now, there are some things that, Mark seems to put in the stories to help tie things together. Like, for example, we're told the woman has this menstrual flow for a period of 12 years. Yep. At the end of the last piece of bread, when Jesus heals the little girl, we're told that she is 12 years old. So it seems to be a connection there. And, you know, why else would Mark put those things together? So he's telling us that there is a correlation, and again, the correlation is faith. Okay, now remember also that there's a connection between the previous two stories. We saw the power of God demonstrated through the person of Jesus, but that power scared people rather than bringing faith. But now we have two examples of faith. Okay, so let's dive in. So we come across in Mark the fact that Jesus is going to get in a boat and he's going to cross again, cross the lake again and go to the other side. So we see a connection with the story of the grassing demoniac and, and the casting out of those demons. Jesus has left that region, that Gentile region of the Decapolis, and now he's gone back across um, the Galilee 
and he's on the Jewish side. Okay, now it doesn't mean that everybody in this story is Jewish, but he comes across to the other side, which is Jewish territory. Right? And when he does that, everybody knowing about Jesus now come out, people come out and they come to see Jesus. And as we often see in Mark, a very large crowd gathers around Jesus. So remember in Mark, the crowds are oftentimes an impediment to Jesus' ministry. Although Jesus, being filled with compassion and love for people, does take care of their needs. And remember, he's there not to heal people from illness, but he's there to heal people from the cause, the root cause of illness. He's there here to deliver us from our sins. But nevertheless, Jesus takes these opportunities to minister to people and to help them with their afflictions and, and their diseases and demon possession, etc. Okay, so as Jesus is on the other side and a crowd gathers around him, a synagogue official named Jairus comes up to him and seeing him falls at his feet. All right, so let's just look at a little bit of the history of synagogues and synagogue leaders. Okay, now, in our thinking, when we think of a leader of a church, you would think of a pastor or some other kind of minister, right? The synagogue leaders weren't actually teachers or trained clergy. They weren't scribes or Pharisees. They could be just about anyone who was faithful in the community and they had their char as their charge to do things like take care of the building maintenance, or at least to oversee it and make sure things get taken care of. They were also in charge of um, uh, basically setting the schedule for the teachers. I don't know, if, have you ever realized, does it seem odd sometimes that Jesus comes into a synagogue and they allow him to teach? You know, you'd think, where's the pastor? Is he giving up his pulpit? Well, back then, they didn't have a preacher or a set teacher. They had lay people, oftentimes, or scribes and Pharisees, who would rotate through and teach every Sabbath. Okay, so the synagogue leader's job, one of his duties, was to make sure there was a schedule of speakers. All right, so this man is, is a lay person who has the charge of taking care of the synagogue. Now, interestingly, uh, one of the commentators said a century after this time, there was a rabbi who mentioned that sometimes the synagogue leaders were women and even children sometimes. So imagine turning over charge of the synagogue to a child. That must have been a very responsible child <laughs> to do that. Either that or they were in dire straits. I don't know. But. So this man is a synagogue leader. And even though he's not a a teacher per se, he does have a position of authority and a great responsibility as the leader of the synagogue. So he comes up. Um, interestingly, Mark records his name. We'll see that with the woman, we're not given her name. Okay. So this is a man of some importance. So he comes up to Jesus and he fell, fall, falls at his feet and he falls at his feet we don't know if it's an act of worship or just an act of desperation, but clearly the man is desperate. His little girl is dying. And in fact, the, the uh, Greek that is used when he tells Jesus that his, his uh, daughter is at the point of death, the euphemism would be like our euphemism, she's at death's door. Okay, so... She's about ready to die. The man's very desperate. He's in a hopeless situation and he's pleading with Jesus to heal his daughter. And the man says, Jairus, my little daughter in verse 23 is at the point of death or he's, she's at death's door. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. All right? So the man is showing faith here because he's coming to Jesus. He recognizes that He's in a hopeless situation, but that Jesus, because of who he is, could do something about it, all right? Now keep that in mind, that he is showing some faith. And then Jesus is, goes off with him, verse 24, he, came, he went off with him and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. Okay, so something we've seen before. There are so many people, they are literally physically crushing Jesus 
And as, as he's walking with Jairus to go to Jairus' house to heal his little daughter. All right. Now, the remarkable thing is that in this crowd, despite there being so many people, imagine trying to walk through this crowd to get to Jesus. We have this woman. Again, she's not named. And she had a hemorrhage for 12 years. Okay, so our translations don't give all the details, but again, this would have been a menstrual flow. So she was at menstrual bleeding for 12 whole years. Now, the significant thing about that, I mean, that would, that would be definitely today something that would be life-altering, right? It would affect your daily life. But you have to recall, in Jesus' day, among the Jews, for a woman to have her menstrual flow, even her normal menstrual flow, she was considered unclean during that time. And you'll see accounts of that in the Bible. Um, Rebecca takes advantage of that when she steals her father's household idols and she lies to him and says that she's sitting on a, can- uh, sitting on a saddle and he can't come near her because she's in, her, she's in, in, in that time of the month, okay? Um, so she would have been ceremonially unclean and in this case, for 12 whole years. And anything she touched or anyone who touched her would also be considered ceremonially unclean. So under the law, if someone touched the woman or touched something that she had been in contact with, they would have been unclean until the evening of that day. Okay? So imagine this woman's predicament. Not only... As she gone through a horrendous medical ordeal for 12 whole years, she has been ceremonially unclean. She would have been cut off from her people. She couldn't touch anyone. No one could touch her. This would have been horrible. Now, Mark really underscores the predicament this world is, this woman is in the world of hurt that she's in, in verse 26. And, and the, the language in the Greek is just like real sharp points. It said, and she had endured much at the hands of many physicians. So who knows all the procedures that they had her go through? And what in the world did they know about medicine back there then? I mean, it had to be a lot of hocus pocus, crazy stuff. Glad we don't have any of that going around today. <laughs> Just go on social media, right? All the crazy things people do. Um, but anyway, she, she's endured a lot at the hands of many different physicians. And who knows what procedures she had to go through, but they may have been humiliating procedures. They may have been painful procedures. They may have gotten, no doubt, her hopes up, and then her hopes were dashed because every time she went to a physician, it ended up not working. Okay, so on top of her being ceremonially unclean in a, in a condition of perpetual shame, she's endured much at the hands of many physicians. And, and many of you may relate to that. I mean, how many doctors have you gone to that couldn't diagnose something that you had? And it just becomes really, really frustrating. Okay. And then, Mark says, and had spent all that she had. So not only had she endured a lot at the hands of many physicians, but in doing that, she spent all of her money, all of her wealth, and now she has nothing. And to make matters worse, she has nothing to show for it. So it says, he, go, he says, Mark says, after that she had spent all she had and was not helped at all, not only wasn't she helped, she had grown even worse. You know, so was it that her discharge or hemorrhage in and of itself just got worse? Or was it that what all of those physicians had done to her made it worse, right? And it's probably a combination of both things. So this woman is absolutely in a hopeless situation. Now, notice though what she does. It says in verse 27, after hearing about Jesus, some translations have after hearing Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. Now, one of the commentators said this is really a sign of discipleship and faith here because disciples hear Jesus 
And when they hear Jesus, what do they do? Run away from him or tell him to leave? No, that's what the people did after he cast out the, demo- the demons and the demoniac. Just like the demoniac, they come to Jesus. So she hears about Jesus and she comes to him. She's exercising faith. She has a hopeless, desperate situation and she is hopeful that Jesus can heal her. She's exercising faith here. Now, the amazing thing is she actually does something that she should not do according to the law and especially according to the additions to the law that our wonderful Pharisees had come up with. She touches Jesus, making him ceremonially unclean. Now, does Jesus care about that? Does Jesus care at all about the additions to the law that the Pharisees have added? No. In fact, he oftentimes just lays down the law himself and tells them they're wrong for what they're doing. So we've seen Jesus touch lepers. We've seen Jesus touch other people that would have been ceremonially unclean. This woman touches him and it doesn't faze him in the least. Now, why does she come up from behind and touch him? Most likely it's because of the predicament she's in. She is ceremonially unclean and has been so for 12 whole years. This woman is carrying a load of shame with her. This is a shameful condition. People would have shunned her. But she has enough faith to come up to Jesus anyway. And she doesn't come up to him face to face. She comes up from behind and just kind of secretly touches his robe. Now, why does she have it in his mind, her mind that touching his robe would be enough? We're not told. Perhaps it's because of the thinking of the day. In ancient times, and before and after Jesus' life on earth, ancient people had it in their minds that people who were uh, people of great authority, like leaders, had power, and that if you just touched them, some of that power would rub off on you. So one of the commentators said that during the time of Alexander the Great, he was known to have people come up and just touch his clothing because they thought that some of his greatness and power would rub off on them. So maybe that's her thinking, maybe not, but it's interesting that she, she has an, at least enough faith to recognize that if she just touches Jesus' clothing, that she will be healed. So she comes up behind him, no doubt because of the shame of her condition, and she touches his cloak. And then, obviously, we're not told this, but obviously, once she does this and she's healed, she doesn't hang around. She gets lost in the crowd, although she's still in the vicinity of Jesus, because we have to see Jesus has to look for her. We just read that. Now, Mark tells us in verse 28, for she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. So again, there's that idea that she had in her mind, if she just touched his garments, everything would be okay, and she was right. In verse 29, Mark tells us immediately the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. So, you know, we don't know why she felt that. Was it because of the power of God? Probably it was because she felt the power of God touch her. And she knew that she had been healed because otherwise you wouldn't just know that bleeding had stopped. I wouldn't think uh, just by, by feeling it. So instant healing as she touches Jesus' cloak. Now, we're never told what Jesus feels usually, I shouldn't say never, but we're rarely told what Jesus feels when he heals. But he must Obviously, he must have been able to tell when the power of God flowed through him because in verse 30, Mark tells us that immediately Jesus perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth. So I'm thinking that the woman knew she had been healed because just as Jesus could feel the power leave him, she felt the power enter her. So not only could you witness the effects of the power of God, you can feel the power of God doing something. So Jesus knows that something had happened, somebody had been healed, and he says, 
He turns around in the crowd, looking around, no doubt, and says, who touched my garments? Now, imagine again the scene. Jesus is lost in a sea of people. They're pressing in on him. Thousands of people are in this crowd. And the disciples, instead of following Jesus' lead and recognizing that something miraculous had happened, they actually seem to be annoyed at Jesus. It's like, you catch that in in what they say. The disciples in verse 31 said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you? Like, Jesus, duh, look at all the people around And you say, who touched me? Good old disciples. (laughs) No wonder Jesus once in a while turns around to them and says, have I been so long with you you and you still don't believe or you don't know or how long will I be with this generation? (laughs) He gets exasperated and no no doubt. I I mean, come on. What did Jesus just do a few, within a few days of this, probably. He's cast out a legion of demons. He's brought a man back into his right mind, made a disciple of him. Before that, Jesus calms the storm. And here's something else miraculous happens, and the, G, the disciples are just annoyed that Jesus is asking the question. I'm glad we're never dense and thick-headed and lack faith like they do. <clears throat> okay. So his disciples said to him, obviously annoyed, you see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, who touched me? I mean, you could just hear the the sarcasm in their voices. But Jesus, in verse 32, looked around to see the woman who had done this. Now, imagine you're the woman, you've kind of stepped back into the crowd, but you're still within sight of Jesus, and you notice him now, looking around for you. And she's probably like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. And she doesn't hide. Instead, being a disciple, she doesn't flee from Jesus. She comes up to him. So verse 33, it says, but the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Now, isn't that a remarkable statement? She is afraid because She's experienced the power of God. She hasn't just seen it like the disciples. She hasn't, he, they haven't just seen it like the legion being cast out. She's actually experienced it. So you can be a disciple and be afraid of the power of God, but notice what the fear doesn't do. It doesn't keep you from Jesus. You still go to him. And this woman, even though she's afraid and actually trembling, she comes to Jesus. This, again, is a sign of true discipleship. And it says, she came down, fell before him, and told him the whole truth. She doesn't hide anything. And I'm assuming here that she's telling Jesus the whole story about her predicament. Otherwise, how does Mark know? I mean, the Holy Spirit could have revealed that later. But remember, Mark is, an eyewit- Mark is not an eyewitness, but Mark is recording what Peter told him. Peter was an eyewitness. Peter saw this. Peter was one of the people who said, why are you asking who touched you? Okay, so no doubt Peter heard the woman tell Jesus all of these details that Mark has relayed to us, that she had had a hemorrhage, a menstrual bleeding for 12 years, that she had suffered much at many physicians' hands, that she had exhausted her livelihood trying to pay these physicians, and that she didn't get any better, but in fact, she got much worse. Now, I don't know about you, but if you were unclean and you touched Jesus, which would have been a faux pas, would you tell him what you had done? She does. She's not afraid. And I think it's because, one, she's grateful, and she is a disciple, and two, she recognizes that Jesus can't, isn't someone you can lie to. He knows. Now, Jesus, now after hearing her story, notice, doesn't say anything about her ceremonial, being ceremonially unclean. He's not irritated with her. He's not mad at her. In fact, he shows great compassion towards her. He says to her, daughter. Now, that's a term of endearment. 
that is a, a term of affection, and it also is a term of family relationship. This woman has now become a daughter of God because she has exercised faith in Jesus. And Jesus says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your infl- affliction. So Jesus recognizes what had happened. The woman exercised faith. It was her faith that made her well. And he tells her to go in peace. Now, there's a, a reason for this account in addition to what we've already said. This woman now has become a model of faith. And she's become a model of faith, not just for us, but someone else. Who's there with Jesus, desperately wanting Jesus' help? Jairus, the synagogue leader. And what we just read, we know that his daughter has died while Jesus was dealing with this woman. So his situation just went from being almost completely hopeless, humanly speaking, becoming absolutely hopeless. Now, if you were faced with that, let's say that you were with Jesus and you had someone in the hospital who was sick and Jesus was on his way with you to go to that person and on the way you found out they died, what would that do to your hope? And what would that do to the faith that you had? But now we've got this woman who's a model of faith. And Jesus has very clearly told her it's her faith that made her well. So hang on to that thought. Now, as Jesus was still speaking to the woman, verse 35, they came from the house of the synagogue official. Who's they? No doubt, attendants or servants of the synagogue official. So again, this man is a man that has authority and a position, and he has some status in the community, unlike this woman who's unnamed. And he's got enough means that he has some servants, it seems like. Okay, and they come, and somehow, probably because there was a commotion around the woman, they find him with Jesus. And they give this terrible news that no one wants to hear, They tell the synagogue official, your daughter has died. It's over. She's dead. She's gone. And then, to just, you know, twist the knife a little bit, why trouble the teacher anymore? You know, Jairus, it's hopeless. She's dead. Leave him alone. Let's just go. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. And Jesus says, yeah, she's dead. It's hopeless. No. (laughs) We're told in verse 36, but Jesus overhearing what was being said. Now, the interesting thing about that word, and it's frustrating being an English speaker, and the frustration comes in because English is such an imprecise language. We have so many, so many words that have more than one meaning, right? Right? So you can think of like the word board. How many different meanings for the word board can you come up with? Forget spelling though, just saying it. You can be bored. You can have a piece of wood, that's a board. You could sit on a board, okay? You can be on board, a ship. And so when this word gets translated um, in verse 36, overhearing, we, it, we don't really see the, the intent of the author here, but Mark uses a masterful word here to describe what's going on. Okay, so that word, the Greek word that's translated Jesus overhearing, can also have three, or total, has a total of three distinct meanings, so two other meanings. Okay, so it can mean to overhear something not intended for one's ears, and that's the translation I have in my NAS. Number two, it could also mean to pay no attention or to ignore what's being said. And then also it can mean to refuse to listen 
to what is being said or to discount it. The reason this is masterful is because the, all three meanings apply to the, Jesus' response here. Jesus hears them, but he pays no attention to it. He ignores the fact that this girl is dead. He just denies, doesn't deny that truth, he ignores it because he knows that he can do something about it. And he doesn't address those offic- the uh, attendants, the they in this passage, but instead he addresses Jairus. And what does he tell Jairus? He tells him, now in the context of what he just told this woman, do not be afraid any longer, only believe. Now, in our passage, we have believe, like it's a one-time act, but literally in the Greek, what Jesus is telling him is keep on believing. So Jairus has some faith. He's come to Jesus. He sought him out to heal his daughter. But now his situation has become completely hopeless humanly speaking, and a completely hopeless situation would tend to destroy your faith. So Jesus tells him, keep on believing. Keep on having faith. Now, one of the things that we should realize from this is that Jairus and the woman have something in common here. They're both in desperate situations, and they're without hope apart from Jesus and the power of God that is being manifested by Jesus. Now, nothing, though, stops this woman from coming to Jesus. And... Unlike Jairus, who's a man of status and is named, she has nothing. She has no name. She has no status. She has no livelihood. What are the only things that she has? Uncleanness and shame. Is that a picture of a sinner? That's all we have, uncleanness and shame. But nothing, absolutely nothing, not even a crowd, not her shame, not the fact that if she touches Jesus is going to make her un- him unclean. Nothing stops her from coming to Jesus. Her faith had no limits. So that's why she serves as a model for Jairus. And Jesus tells Jairus, don't fear, keep on believing. In other words, don't let your faith have any limits. He's commanding Jairus, Jesus is commanding Jairus to have the same kind of faith that the woman does. Now, if you were to watch a lot of the people that are on TV, the TV preachers, and I don't recommend that you watch most of them, there are very few, but if you did, many of them would say that You, if you were in a terrible, hopeless situation, if God didn't come through, it was because you did not have enough faith. All right, you know what I'm talking about? All right. So are we to expect, based on this story, that every time we have someone in the hospital that's sick or we're sick or someone's died, that we, if we just have enough faith, should expect God to heal them or to raise them from the dead? And the obvious answer should be no. Okay. But we do learn from the faith that they have, and that faith comes when we think about ourselves in the context of being sinners. Okay, I'll get back to that in a little bit. Okay, so this woman has served as a model for Jairus. Jesus commands Jairus to keep on believing and not to be afraid to keep on trusting him. And Jesus just goes with him, but now he only allows Jairus and three of his disciples to accompany him. He allows Peter, James, and John. 
the inner three. Okay, so these are the three uh, disciples who make up the inner group of disciples. These are the disciples of the disciples. And we see oftentimes when something really special happens, Jesus takes these three, like at the transfiguration. Okay, so he allows no one to accompany him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And they make it to the house of the synagogue official in verse 38. And as Jesus comes, he sees a commotion in people loudly weeping and wailing. Okay, now, why are they doing this? They're doing this because one, they know the little girl is dead. Two, they're doing it because many of them have been paid to do it. Okay, so it was the custom in Jesus' day and a time before Jesus' day and a time after that when someone died, you hired professional mourners. Okay, so um, about a, a century after this, one rabbi wrote that even the poorest women in Jerusalem, or, or in Israel, Jerusalem was destroyed by them, should have hired at least two flute players and one mourner. So no matter how poor you were, you were expected to hire people to mourn. Why? I think it's like today. People like to make money off of people's debt. I don't know. (laughs) Is it just me? Doesn't it bother you that they charge so much to do a funeral? It seems like you're taking advantage of people. But anyway, it just was the custom why they did it. Um, Not not 100% sure. I, I mentioned this a few weeks ago. If you've ever... Uh, seen somebody from the Middle East wail because of something sad, it, it's, it's horrendous. It's so sad, so, so heart-wrenching. So Pam and I have worked with uh, Middle Easterners, the Yazidis, and after um, the uh, say Holocaust, it was the, the time when ISIS destroyed their villages around Sinjar, and so many Yazidis were killed or captured, uh, we were at a memorial for that, and when they started showing scenes, this one woman just started wailing. And it was just one woman, and it was just heart-wrenching. It was awful. I'll never forget it. I couldn't imagine there being lots of women wailing like she was. Okay? So there would have been a big commotion now going on because there's a lot of noise. People are wailing. People are weeping. There's music being played. It's just, uh, you know, just a dirge probably, and all of the, the, this would have, would have caused a great commotion. And no doubt, Jairus is a man of at least some means, so he hired probably quite, the people at the house hired quite a few of these mourners. Okay. Now, Jesus, upon entering in, and we don't know if he's entering the crowd or the house here, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? Why are you doing this? The child has not died, but is asleep. Now, unusual statement, and some of the critical scholars, those who want to discount the Bible, said that this really wasn't Jesus healing or raising a girl from the dead, but that the people were mistaken. She was just asleep, and Jesus was just going to resuscitate her. But we have to take it that she was dead. The people knew she was dead. Professional mourners aren't going to be fooled by that. I mean, there's definitely a funeral going on here. Jesus probably used these words, well, maybe, maybe used these words just to give Jairus some hope and to see his daughter as just being asleep, that it wasn't something that was irreversible as we look at death being irreversible because he was there and he could heal her, raise her from the dead. But she, was di- she died, and, and Jesus is going to raise her. Now, the people began laughing at him. That's sad. It shows you where people are at. No doubt the people knew about Jesus. They knew that Jairus had gone off to go seek Jesus' help, and they still laugh at Jesus, even though he's demonstrated so much power and authority over things like death. But nevertheless, undaunted, Jesus took along the child's father and mother, it says in verse 40, and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. And then in verse 31, he took the child by the hand. Notice there's a theme here. Jesus' touch 
or touching Jesus is enough to heal. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, and if you notice, I don't know if your Bibles have it, but in NAS, there's a, a star in front of said that indicates that it's a command. So Jesus is commanding the dead. Um, you know, he's done that in other cases too. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, he said, Lazarus, come forth. So God has enough power, he can command the dead. And that's our hope, right? When Jesus comes back at the resurrection, he's going to command that everyone in the graves rise. So we'll hear that command one day if we die before he comes back. So taking the, the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum. Okay, so this is an Aramaic phrase, and Talitha means to rise, to rise up. And then kum is an Aramaic term of endearment. It can mean um, like a little lamb, like you might call a child a little lamb or something like that, or little child. So it's a, a term of endearment. So Jesus commands this child using a compassionate term to get up. In other words, to raise from the dead. Now, Notice that Mark has to translate to Letha Kum. Is that for our benefit? Partly yes. But one thing when you interpret the Bible is you have to realize that the, whatever book it is, whatever letter it is, that book or letter had to make sense and have meaning to the original audience. Okay? So then why is Mark translating this Aramaic term? All the Jews would have spoken this language because he wasn't writing primarily to Jews. Remember, Mark's audience was predominantly Greek and Greek speakers. So he translates this for them, and we can tell that he was writing to a non-Jewish audience uh, as, because of this. So it means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Now, Jesus, exercising the same power and authority that we've seen him exercise multiple times now, like when he calmed the sea and when he cast out the demons, as soon as he gives a command, there's immediate response. His command has power. It does what he commands. And isn't that true always for God? How did God create the universe? Oh, I know, he got some mud and he started making a little ball and he made it get larger and larger. He kept adding mud to it and he made the earth, right? No, how did God make everything in the universe? He simply spoke it into existence. I don't know about you, but that's power, okay? And we see Jesus exercising that same power. Incidentally, what does the New Testament tell us about who created the heavens and the earth? The Father created them through the Son. So this is the same way that the Son created everything that we know. He just spoke it into existence, he commanded it. And here he has the power to command someone who is dead to rise up from the dead. So immediately the girl got up and began to walk. Now, we're told she was 12 years old. Up to this point, we don't know how young she is. Is she a baby that can't walk? Is she a toddler that hasn't learned to walk? No, she can walk because she's 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astounded. I bet they were. How many of you have seen someone raise another person from the dead? I haven't. Now, you'd be shocked if you saw that. And that's what's happened here. They were completely astounded. And then he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And he said that something should be given to her to eat. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus is concerned about this little girl having something to eat. So he commands the people to give her something to eat. And he also tells them not to tell anyone, which is a familiar theme. Probably because the more word gets out about Jesus, the larger the crowds get and the more his ministry is hampered. So how does this apply to us? Should we, like so many preachers, and I use that word reluctantly, <laughs> because it's, a lot of them are charlatans, should we take their word that if we don't see someone healed or someone raised from the dead, 
or we don't have, oh, I don't know, a Mercedes Benz like they do, that it's because we don't have enough faith. Should we go around expecting God to do these same miracles today? Now, God can still heal, and he does, but it's not something that we should expect. We know that. Paul didn't even expect that people he knew should be healed necessarily, okay? And also note that, again, these kinds of miracles don't bring faith. Faith brings the miracles. So we should not expect that God should heal the sick all the time or raise the dead. It doesn't mean then that we don't have enough faith. So what can we take from this since we don't live during a time when these kinds of miracles are being performed by Jesus as he walks around on the earth? Well, as I said earlier, what should, we should realize is, like the woman, no matter how hopeless our situation, no matter how unclean we are from sin, no matter how shameful our condition, we should never run away from Jesus, but we should always go to him if we're believers, knowing that we have already been forgiven if we've come to trust him and that we shouldn't run away and that we should seek his help to stop the sinning. We should also recognize if we are not believers and we hear him call and we are sinful, no matter what we've done, he can take care of it. No sinner is beyond hope unless someone has gone so far that their conscience is so severely hardened after God has called them. But remember, God's call is effectual. Just as Jesus commanded the dead girl to rise, he commands dead sinners to rise, and when he does, they do. So if there is anyone in your life that you think is too far gone, don't give up faith, keep praying. God may still save them. And don't worry about their rejecting because if God gives the effectual call, they will obey and they will follow. Hopefully that brings hope to us to realize that no situation is completely hopeless. And we also have to recognize too, and there are a lot of people in the world that are evil and evil is being manifested, that God's grace can touch even those people. And so what should we do for them? Pray. Not condemn, not get mad, not yell, although that's what we want to do, but pray for them. So no situation is hopeless if we have faith in Jesus. Now also, as Jesus told Jairus, keep on believing, no matter what. We have to recognize we haven't gotten there yet, but... Jesus has an encounter with a man who says, I believe, but help my unbelief. And we have to recognize that even as believers, we have this strange mix of belief and unbelief in us. And aren't you glad, though, that our faith doesn't have to be perfect? It's not the amount of faith like the faith healers tell us. It's the object of our faith, Jesus. And Jesus sets the bar high when he says, if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard. That's not a lot, but it's the object of our faith, Jesus, that matters. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these examples of faith that we are given by this woman who had the hemorrhage and Jairus. I pray, Father, that uh, we would hear your command to keep on believing whenever we go through trials, tribulations, and situations that seem hopeless. And when things don't go our way when someone dies or someone is sick and is not healed. Help us to have faith that that's part of your purpose and that you are carrying out your purposes and that you cause all things to work together for good to those who are called by you, those who love you, those who are saved. And Father, I pray that as a result of being here today, we would be strengthened in our faith and that we would always, no matter how large or small or imperfect our faith is, come to Jesus. And we ask all of these things in his name. Amen.